Hello and welcome to At The Controls with Jonathan Ledyard and Mark Gallagher, the podcast which takes inspiration from Formula One. The people, the passion, the technology and the positive philosophy which underpins the sport and the 2020 season may have ended, but the stories keep on coming. New ownership for Mercedes, new drive, new team for Sergio Perez, new partnership for W Series, the Women Only Racing Championship and a new British driver in Formula One. Callum Eilert, runner-up in Formula Two, is Ferrari's new test driver. We'll talk to Callum, to the W Series Chief Executive Catherine Bonnior and to Jess Hawkins, one of the 18 drivers confirmed for 2021. But Mark, you've also been busy talking to two big F1 names about some of 2020's big talking points. Absolutely, Jonathan. I've been doing some work with Mark Webber at this week's Black Book Motorsport Direct event online and also with my good pal, Mika Hakkinen. Uh, thanks to Unibet. Uh, we were working on a podcast and he very kindly talked to me uh, about some of his thoughts on recent happenings. So it was great to talk to them about Lewis Hamilton's domination, but also the stellar performance of Sergio Perez in claiming his first Grand Prix win. And, of course, McLaren in returning towards the front of Formula One's field with a stunning third place in the Constructors' Championship just three short years after they finished a lowly ninth. It's an extraordinary story and some really interesting thoughts, too, from Mika, as as Mark's just said. But before we hear from them, what about the changes at Mercedes then? The team now owned in three equal parts by Daimler, Ineos and Toto Wolff, the team principal, staying on in a role for another three years. So if you remember his comments after that recent race when he said, I need to work out with my shelf life. Have I, is my shelf life over? Well, it's clearly refreshed, seemingly. Um, and he's taken on this extra responsibility, Mark. Absolutely. I have to say, I think the Mercedes-Benz announcement is a pretty formidable coup by all of the parties involved. Daimler have reduced their shareholding in the team to 33%. Toto Wolf has increased his shareholding from 30 to 33%. And then Sir Jim Ratcliffe, boss of the Ineos chemicals giant, has come in as the new partner. And maybe we shouldn't be that surprised to see Sir Jim Ratcliffe come in as the new partner because he's already been sponsoring the team, also working with their applied technologies division on his other sporting passions in terms of sailing and cycling. But I think this is a formidable structure that they have created. And therefore, I'm not surprised to see Toto Wolf recommit as chief executive and team principal for another three years because he's really got the perfect formula. He's got a manufacturing company in in the automotive industry supporting him fully and allowing him to still use the Mercedes brand name across everything. So Mercedes' commitment is absolutely resolute. But there is now the strength of having a third partner involved. So whatever happens in the future, you have to say this is great news for the team and great news for all the staff in Brackley and Bricksworth to have fresh partners coming into the uh, into the team at this particular juncture. So I think really a big, big step forward for the team. And it feels to me like a strengthening of both Toto Wolff and Mercedes-Benz commitment to Formula One. And that can only be good news. I'm going to pick up on your use of the word strength in there because I wonder if Red Bull Racing feel the same way because far from being left on the scrap heap in Formula 1, Sergio Perez finds himself partnering Max Verstappen next season, which means surely a realistic prospect of challenging for race victories and who knows, maybe even the championship if the team can find some answers to the Mercedes competitive advantage, surely. It's got to be one of the best news stories we've seen in recent times, isn't it, Jonathan? To see a driver like Sergio, who's been around, you know, he's been kind of part of the furniture for such a long time. And after 190 Grand Prix, he wins his first race. He wins his 190th Grand Prix in Sakir in Bahrain. And uh, yes, perhaps it was gifted to him somewhat, but he was there. He took the opportunity and what a brilliant result that was. And it's whether that tipped the balance or not, we don't know. But the fact of the matter is this announcement from Red Bull Racing is just amazing for him. And I'm personally, you know, having been to the Mexican Grand Prix many times, I've seen the look on the fans' faces when they realise that their hero has really no prospect of winning a Grand Prix. So for the Mexican fans, they will be absolutely euphoric about this news. And there will be huge excitement when it comes to the Mexican Grand Prix in 2021. Now, I've been talking to Mark Weber, and I started really by asking Mark about the other man of the moment, I suppose, really in Formula One, Mr. Lewis Hamilton, seven times world champion, and asked Mark really what he thought about Lewis's uh, formidable domination of Formula One and whether in fact he really does get all the credit that he deserves for his success. I think from from his colleagues and, and the industry as a whole, I think that we know that 
it's it is an extraordinary achievement. Could it get even more? Um, I suppose credit externally, maybe yes, because people want to keep uh, mentioning the car and the sort of the the technology that he has at his disposal. But ultimately, you know, as we know, mate, the best people want to work with the best people. Retention of staff, uh, the right culture, um, you know, and he's he's a bit of an you know he's the embodiment of of that sort of the consistent work ethic that, that he turns up with the, with the right body language and he always delivers. Ultimately, when you've got someone like that in the car, even when it's not quite going well for them in the build-up to certain Grand Prix, I'm talking the last five years now, not you know not just particularly this year, but he always seems to manage to jag something out very special. So um, very, very dependable, very consistent and deserves absolutely everything he, he, he gets. Um, it's been a special year for him and he wrapped it up in Turkey in such a Hamilton fashion. It was like a bit of a slow kill, really. He just sort of followed them around the first part of the Grand Prix, watched everyone else crumble with uh, decisions around pit stops and he just said, well, I'm just going to do this and... Um, and he closed it out brilliantly. So, uh, yeah, very, very special guy. And next year looks will be very strong for him as well. Pretty extraordinary that he's out of contract. Yeah, I don't know how that was all, how it is all being played out at the moment. Obviously, you know, him and Toto um, enjoy a very good relationship, I believe. I think that uh, they would have liked it to have been nipped in the bud by now. But obviously the timing around certain things, particularly you know, his, his virus right at the end there and, you know, this sort of this budget cap which is coming in for drivers in the future where that's going to clip him in the back part of his, depending on how long the term of the contract is, of course, it's not going to be starting next year, but looking at how that would potentially challenge the back end of his contract in terms of how the, the numbers look, would look. So I'm sure that's all on the table and he wants to, you know, extinguish every single opportunity he can financially out of the situation because uh, he, he believes he has a value and he does. Um, he brings a lot to the sport. He brings a lot to Mercedes. He, you know, he is, he is box office um, and he wants that to be recognised. How much of a factor do you think it is for Toto that he was able to drop George Russell into Lewis's car and deputise yeah. for him? And, and I mean, it, whether they have a good relationship or not, that's bound to affect to some extent the, the balance in terms of the negotiation. Absolutely. Uh, I think that was, you know, the timing for Lewis was, was just horrible. Uh, I think that, um, you know, we all thought during the season, imagine if Lewis or someone in the championship battle got, got COVID and missed a few races or let's say a double header, you know, which, it, you know, it was, you know, Bahrain Abu Dhabi was a double header in effect, different countries, yes, but he had already wrapped the championship up. But you're right, it was still, it just goes to show you, mate, doesn't it, in Formula One, never, ever, ever, you know, I think I drove a thousand days in a Formula One car with testing and practice and Grand Prix and weekends, the whole thing put together over sort of 12, 13 years. I think it's, if you look at how many actual physical days in the car, and I think I had three days off, that's because I don't want anyone near my car because it's only, you know, you're just you're trying to look after your own share price. You don't want people to have exposure to your material and your people. And, and it's such a cutthroat industry. Even someone like Lewis, you know, that was all downside for him uh, generally. And, and George drove well. Yes, it was the easiest track in the world. It wasn't exactly Suzuka, but he still drove brilliantly in a, in a compromised ergonomically environment in the car. So, yeah. Uh, Toto again, you know, he certainly likes the tightrope in terms of you know playing the game with uh, lots of different things in the pit lane, and that was another one where you know it looks like it's come in in his favour. The only real challenge challenge your Mercedes Benz had this year were your old crew at Red Bull Racing, and specifically Max, Max much more than Alex Albon. Um, just give us your view on Red Bull's challenge because they were nearly there most of the time. They had a couple of victories, but it's still just. There was still that little bit just not quite there in terms of matching the, Mer the Mercedes package, despite the progress that Honda have made. Yeah, you're right, mate. I think just look at the, the overall package we talk about, or the you know the consistency of the car, you know, going to every single venue, you know, whether it's high downforce, whether it's low downforce, whether it's Monza or Monaco. Or clearly, we didn't go to, to Monaco this year, but the calendar was condensed this year. A lot of the venues dropped off. Um, so in terms of if you found a track that was quite strong for you. You know, then you had a double, you know, had a double chance. Obviously, with Merck, you know, at, at some other places, they could they could continue to have that dominance because you're at the same venue, effectively, apart from Bahrain, which is a different layout. But so, yeah, I think that Red Bull, you know, they did they did what they could. I think openly they know that they they were down a sniff on power, but even you know, even Adrian Newey, who's you know the last guy that's going to mention that they you know they haven't done a good job because he's he's well he's he's honest, but he's also very protective of his aerodynamic and his uh, department and his team and 
and the the part that Milton Keynes does. And he said, look, at the start of the year, we just didn't have the car either. You know, we just were not good enough. We couldn't blame it all on Honda. I think at the end of the year, they got the car together. Um, so we saw the performance a bit in, in, in Abu Dhabi, but, you know, did Merck start to peel it back a little bit? And then they had the disruption, mate, as we know, with, with Honda pulling out. And that's a real headache. I don't care who you are, but it does, as a business, you know, it just takes your eye off the ball a little bit. You've got to start other facets of people's sort of energy and focus have got to start looking at other options. You know, when you haven't got that continuity of the power unit, um, you know, you can't focus on other areas and, and all the other small details. So that's a headache. Um, and I think that, you know, let's see how they start the back of or they start of next year with with the transition of, of finishing with Honda, and then they've got to get themselves ready for twenty two with a new, well, a a different type of uh, scenario with with the engine, whether it's a Honda rebadged and then funding it or or something else. Who knows? But um, that's not the ideal scenario for them. Now, the fact that after one hundred and ninety tries, Sergio Perez finally nicked a win in uh, in Sakir, and I think the whole of Formula One were delighted to see. Racing Point and Sergio get that. I mean, a very emotional moment for him. And I suspect if nothing else better ever happens in his sporting career, that that is the pinnacle. An extraordinary story. Yeah, I think you're right. We're all happy for him. Uh, he has driven some really special races this year. Uh, I mean, the car has been quick. Um, I think that he's, he's led the team well. Uh, we've seen a lot of chances where Lance has showed some potential, which is a horrible word. But, you know, that's why these Grand Prix are you know, nearly two hours because it's hard to, to close them out. Um, and you need that level of consistency over a long period of time in a Grand Prix on Sunday afternoon or night or wherever you're racing. So that's why I sort of make the analogy of like, it's a little bit like test match cricket or it's about five set Grand Slam tennis. You know, you can have, you know, a short format of cricket. You can have a short format of five set, no, three set tennis, but Grand Prix racing still just flushes that last part out. And, and Sergio has, you know, had so many special events this year where he's driven so well on Sundays. Also, some good qualifiers, mind you. Had a little bit of tough reliability, but you know, just all it all came together. You know, he was last at the start of that Grand Prix up in the first sector, got nailed by by Leclerc in, in turn four. Um, but just come back brilliantly, and we're all stoked for him, mate. And great for the market too. I mean, Mexico's been a really great um, you know promoter of of, yeah. uh, of Liberty in terms of that working with them, going to that region for the first time. So that's been that's been great. So I think we, you know, we need him on the grid next year, and who knows where it'll be, but it might be Milton Keynes. I think it's fair to say, isn't it, Mark, that uh, there was no guesswork on Mark Webber's part there. He knew Sergio Perez was definitely going to be alongside Max Verstappen for next season at Red Bull. Well, one of the downsides of a podcast is you couldn't see the smile on Mark Webber's face when he said Milton Keynes. And I it was just imagining, you know, the fact Sergio Perez is going to have to go to the glamorous destination of Milton Keynes to ply his trade going forward. So, yes, I think you're absolutely right, John. I think Mark Webber was fully aware of the fact that that's where uh, Dr. Dr. Helmut Marko and Dietrich Mateschitz and Christian Horner were thinking of placing their bets for the driver to partner um, Max Verstappen next season. Fantastic news for Formula One, it has to be said. Now, um, let's just move on to talk about McLaren because there's no doubt that uh, much to the disappointment of Racing Point at the last race, McLaren overtook them and finished third in the World Constructors' Championship. And this felt like a real victory, I think, for Zach Brown, for Andreas Seidel, and for the board of directors of McLaren, who went through a very tough time just a few years ago and finishing ninth in the World Championship in 2017 and now rising to finish third. So when I spoke to Mika Hakkinen, I started really by asking him about the success achieved by his former team. And you can imagine he's pretty delighted. Definitely. And if you look, to, if you look the results, uh, if I'm correct, that way, when we had a first Grand Prix this year in Austria, I think uh, if I remember correctly, London was third. And, and the way the season... Uh, finished, I think the performance what the McLaren did over the year was a great development all the time, improving the car. Uh, so, so the consistency is there, and this consistency can bring the results and development for the team. Uh, I can see that what McLaren has done this year with uh, with these two great drivers is. When I look at the overall picture, what the marketing has done with the team, they've done a brilliant work. You know, image is a very important part of the team. I tell you what, the very 
when I look back in my time when I was raising McLaren, was a team which was quite a cold team outside. You know, it was very straightforward operating team and and difficult to difficult to enter. You know, it was difficult to enter to have a relaxed atmosphere. At Jordan Grand Prix, we just thought you were all really unfriendly. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that kind of image is from outside what McLaren had in the past. But, th- but that was Ron. Ron was quite a cold guy because he was a tough businessman. Yeah, it was his way of it was hundred percent his way of running a system, and it worked. You know, it just simply worked, and it was fantastic. Now these days, the time is changing, generation is changing, people still thinking differently, and I I see that. Uh, what Zach Brown has been able to bring to McLaren, uh, the marketing work, what they have done, beautiful stuff. I mean, fans loving it, partners loving it. They want to be part of the McLaren. Drivers, they are pushed very much on the limit from the engineers, from the mechanics to get the great success when they sit in a car and they put the crash helmet on. Drivers, Two drivers are fighting really aggressively uh, against each other out there to creating best possible result and the lap time. And the technical wise, they are super developing all the time and knowing that way they are going to use Mercedes engine next year, again, with a little bit smaller engine, uh, smaller cooling guts in a car will keep the better aerodynamic performance so there's a lot of little details what 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 looks great in a, in the future but this year definitely all those elements put in together not just the result on the black and white end of the day after the season it definitely looks brilliant looking back down in a few years ago now it's just the, all the elements which requires the team to be good has been happening. And it looks like it's moving forward in the same direction all the time. And and knowing Zach Brown's energy level, what he has to run the team, I know it's going to go in the right direction. It's absolutely mega. Let, let's move on to talk about Valtteri. Uh, your good friend, a fellow Finn, uh, you've been involved with his career. Um, Valtteri finished second in the World Championship. He won two Grand Prix this year, two pole positions. He won in he won the opening race in Austria. He also won, of course, Russia. He's very good round Sochi. He's always performed extremely well uh, there. He had a strong year, 11 podium uh, finishes. And yet Valtteri gets a hard time from fans because he's not beating Lewis Hamilton every single weekend. It's quite difficult, isn't it, Mika, to communicate just how quick Valtteri is. He has out-qualified Lewis this year about one-third of the time. An extremely fast driver, but he's got a tough job, possibly the toughest job in Formula One up against the seven times world champion. Yes, of course, it is a difficult position to be. When I was a young guy coming from Team Lotus, racing there a couple of years, and then sitting in a racing car, which was a McLaren, and the, the other car in a team. McLaren, the driver who was sitting there was Ayrton Senna. So that was a tough moment for me. It was a tough moment because cameras everywhere, people everywhere. I mean, the whole, everybody, the Formula One world was looking. Ayrton Senna. They were looking Ayrton Senna. There he is, the great three times world champion. And uh, I was there with the full confidence, with the thinking in him, my mind, without not saying it loud, but thinking that way, I have to kick his ass. I have to win. I have to win. And I have to, put, I have to be quicker than him. And, and uh, I was... I was big lucky. I was big fortunate. I was quicker than him in the first qualification when we did in the first practice and first qualification in our first Grand Prix. So the whole world exploded. I said, well, the Formula One world, some of the cameras turned to me and said, Mika, what did you do? How you can beat this guy? He's a three times world champion. He's a 
star of qualification. Nobody has been beating him. And of course, me, young guy, says it's normal. It's normal, of course. It's, it's, uh, I'm, not here to, I'm not here to lose. I'm here to win. And, and uh, it was interesting. Uh, then when Arton recognized that, hold on a second, this young guy, he's bloody quick. I, you know, I have to now take all my effort, all of my experience in my career to do in a desk when I'm working with the engineers to find that way I can kick this young Finnish driver's butt. That way I can beat him because it's no way I allow him to be faster than me. So that's what he did. He used every possible trick what he ever has collected in his career to be faster than me. And it worked. I did last three Grand Prix with him and I had some mechanical failures. I'm pretty confident I could have beat him in second Grand Prix. What I did with him was it was in Japan and I'm confident I could have beat him. But I had a brake failure in a qualification or something like this. And then going to last Grand Prix in Australia, he was, I think, four tenths quicker than me in, in qualification in Adelaide. You know, it was so annoying. And, and uh, I'm studying the data. It was just the one corner where he was quicker. Very difficult left-hander, a little bit bumpy in the entrance. And he was able to carry much more speed through that corner. It really put my feet on the ground. I said, Mika, hey. I start looking in the mirror myself. Mika, how good you really are. And I realized that way I do have to work harder. But also... My engineers, I have to start demanding much more from them too. You know, it just doesn't enough to make guys come into corners. It's oh, it's a little bit understeering. No, 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 no. They have to go to the next level and find the ways from the whole McLaren team what we can do to make Mika to go quicker. Uh, so it's a teamwork. So coming back to Valtteri. Uh, being in this incredible position in a Mercedes team, incredible results this year, 2020, fighting against this great champion, Lewis Hamilton. You know, similar work going on in his mind constantly, pushing himself, pushing the engineers, finding a way, the solutions, why I'm there one ten slower, what they have different, how the engineers can find this, the driver, racing driver is not qualified to be engineer. He's not qualified to be aerodynamic designer. He has to push the team to find the solutions. And you have to improve yourself in your quality of your knowledge, your information, and to work hard. But at the same time, to find a way to relax. You cannot squeeze the steering for nearly two hours in a Grand Prix. Otherwise, you collapse. You have to learn to also way to relax and to work smooth all the way, and to be fast to your teammate. And Valtteri doing that, he's all the time developing. But when you're against the best, it's, God damn it, it's tough. It's so hard. Plus, like you mentioned, Mark, the pressure what's coming from the social media, pressure what's coming from the fans, from the team, it's enormous to take to handle it. But it will work. It will work for Valtteri. It will work because Valtteri has a great supporting team behind him in his private life, in his working life. So it's a question of time matter when things are going in the right place. So it's no point to give up. It is no point to give up. His only way is to go flat out and to learn. Now, perhaps not surprising to hear Mika Hakkinen being so supportive of Valtteri Bottas, but I think we all are a little bit guilty of being critical of Valtteri, and yet we all know that he's up against the most formidable talent of a generation, and he clearly does a sterling job. Otherwise, Mercedes-Benz wouldn't keep uh, re-signing him as they as they keep doing. We know Toto Wolff, and indeed we know James Allison from our previous podcast, very happy with the structure of that driver lineup and the way in which they both perform. 
Still to come on the show, we'll be talking to Ferrari's newest recruit, Britain's Callum Eilot, announced as test driver alongside Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz. So 2021 promises to be a big year for him. And the same goes for W Series and their CEO, Catherine Bonmure, who, as you're about to hear, was reduced to tears when COVID wrecked her plans for 2020. The momentum of 2019's debut year as a women-only racing series lost as the season was called off. And the drivers like Jess Hawkins, who we're also about to hear from, were left scratching around trying to make a living. But W Series will be back with a bang next year. The series has recently announced an eight-race calendar in a new partnership with Formula One, which means they'll be on the support bill at venues like Silverstone and Spa, Austin and Mexico. So as Catherine and Jess have been explaining, plans for the series to be bigger and better in the future are back on track. It is unbelievably exciting. Look, what's happened for W Series is that in our second year, we're going to be racing on the largest global motorsports platform. And so it doesn't really get much better than that. So we are, you know, so excited by it. But now what we see is between now and our first race at the end of June is we've got a huge amount of work that we've got to do, you know, to make sure that we have a perfectly produced motor racing series. And, you know, what we've got to do is have as as high quality racing as, as we had in our first year, but also be able to deliver a great experience to the fans actually at the Formula One events. How easy and how accessible did Formula One make it for you to say, yep, come on board, this is what we want? Well, we, we've been speaking to Formula One for a couple of years. So in 2020, we were supposed to have a couple of races with them in Austin and Mexico. So obviously, the conversations have been happening for quite a long time. And I think that conversation developed significantly in the last few months. They made a step change from thinking, you know, let's just have a couple of races with Formula One to, to say, well, you know, we will host you for all of your races next year if you want. So very much the hashtag we race as one. It includes, as you would say, diversity, but also inclusion now very much on the agenda after, dare one say it, the sport has dragged its feet for quite some time, wouldn't you say? Well, I'm now chair of the EDI Committee for Motorsport UK. So I'm I'm really at the the forefront of what is happening in the UK at this. And I I think it's important to look forward and see what we can be as a motorsport rather than to look back and and say, you know, motorsport is incredibly male and pale. Let's see what what we can be in the future. Jess, if I can just turn to you, when you heard that uh, W Series would be supporting Formula One, events what was your reaction to that news because it's a it's a huge change and and an impressive move for for the championship but also for you as a driver yeah I mean obviously what better platform to be racing under than the Formula One package really so first of all I was a bit shocked and not shocked in a bad way shocked in a good way um firstly for me just even to be racing again is a massive massive thing for myself But to be racing on that package with W Series just takes it to a whole new level. Now, for the benefit of our listeners, uh, Jess, just talk us through your career, why you got involved in in motor racing. How did that evolve? And just talk us through a little bit of how your career developed until you arrived in W Series. So I started when I was eight years old. I started karting. Um, I was always a sporty kid. I played. My parents were separated from a very young age. Every other weekend, I used to go and play different sports with my dad. And one day, there was this go-kart track in the distance, and I begged him to let me have a go. Um, Luckily for him, I was too small at the time, um, but we went back six months later, and they'd moved the height restriction down, um, much to his despair, actually. Um, But I had a go, and um, I fell in love with it straight away. I literally gave up all my other sports, and that was that, really. And... It's become my life ever since, and I wouldn't change it for the world, really. But budget always was an issue for myself, and it really came to a head when I was about 15. Um, So prior to W Series, I'd only ever had one full season of car racing. And before W Series, I didn't race for two, three years, something like that. So I'd gone off into the stunt direction because... That's more where my career took me. And I instead of, you know, having to pay for drives, I was being paid to do the stunt work. And I really enjoyed it. And although it wasn't racing, it was a very, very good substitute. 
Um, and it was only W Series that really gave me that second opportunity to, to go racing again. Catherine, if I can uh, turn to you, um, it's really interesting to hear Jess talk about the fact that she hadn't raced for two or three years. And as we know, Alice Powell had a big gap in her career. And I'm sure throughout the field, there has been other examples of these women drivers unable to find the budget to go racing. To what extent have you as chief executive of W Series found that the corporate world likes to talk the talk about supporting diversity and inclusion, but doesn't actually you know, walk the walk? They don't actually deliver the goods when it comes to the funding, which quite frankly to me seems ludicrous because what could be a better story for a major corporation to be involved in than actually promoting women through to top level motorsport? I think if in the last few years, if you look at the funding going into women's sport in comparison with the men's, um, it is paltry the amount of money that is that is going in. I think some of the major brands are starting to redress that. You know, both Nike and Adidas have have made big investments into women's sport. I think that a lot of the conversations that we're having now, we are having because those brands believe that they need to start supporting women's sport. We're a very young sport and the brands, I think, are engaging with us because they want to join us on our journey of promoting and widening the participation of women in motorsport. We hopefully will be announcing some you know, really good sponsorships in the next few months. Uh, but, you know, let's wait and see. So what, what is the message that you bring to companies when you talk to them about W Series? If, if we were to give you a, a platform for a minute to talk about what are the, what are the strengths that W Series can bring a, an organization? Because I think it's so important that uh, companies really do think about the opportunity that, what, that your initiative has brought. Well, we, W Series has a global mission to promote um, equality and encourage more women to participate in motorsport. And that is a mission that spreads across the world. So for brands coming to sponsor us, they are joining themselves on that mission and therefore really are walking that walk of you know, diversity and equality instead of, as you saying, you know, people saying that they are involved in it and yes, we're going to do something. And it is a very public way of them putting the flag in the ground saying, yes, we're actually going to you know, in, invest in these values, which we say are important to us. What about for both of you, how difficult 2020 has been on that point? Because profile, <laughs> coverage, uh, action on the track, that's what it's about in terms of promoting the sport. That hasn't happened. So how difficult has it been for you in your role, Catherine? Let's say with Jess, how difficult for you as a driver wanting to carry on and yet you've been on hold? How have you, how have you come through 2020? Well, I mean, there were two big moments for me in 2020. One back in March when the world really was starting to fall apart. And I did have a personal moment. I can remember it very clearly just in the the corner of my bedroom and I was looking towards the walls and, you know, and, and I, you know, just burst out crying, thinking, you know, we've achieved so much and actually this is potentially all going to fall round my ears, you know, and we would have been a one hit wonder. And, you know, all of this work that I've put into the last four years is actually for nothing you know, our critics will say, yeah, told you so. Yeah, you're not going to survive. You only had one year. And then the second difficulty was actually on the you know, the Zoom calls with the drivers, you know, actually saying that we were going to cancel the season. And I had, you know, obviously butterflies going into that call because it's it's bad enough giving, you know, one person bad news, but giving... 18 drivers, the news that, you know, I'm going to take their dreams of that year away from them is not great. And, you know, what I would say is that it, it just shows what an extraordinary bunch of drivers that we have at W Series, because their immediate reaction was because I think they realised, you know, how, you know, upset I was about this call. They were saying, you know, it's fine, you know, we understand, are you all right? This must be right for you. And 
our drivers have got to be, by definition, you know, a gutsy bunch of women. You know, you haven't been a woman that has been trying to make it in motorsport for the last 10 years without having, you know, real determination and, as I say, guts. So, you know, that, you know, really, really shone through bearing in mind the background of, of this really bad call. Then I had this really great call with them, you know, about telling them that we were going to be all in with Formula One. And um, the reaction was unbelievable because it was so deeply underwhelming. So I was expecting <laughs> screams and shouts and everyone going crazy saying, this is fantastic. And Jess alluded to it. She said that they were, she was a bit stunned, but you know I had 18 drivers in front of me, and I think about the only one who clicked it immediately was Vicky Piria, and she was going a bit crazy, but everyone else was just really quiet. And take it from me, Jonathan, the W Series drivers being quiet is not a common characteristic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but... It was after the call, I, I started getting all messages from them and going, oh, this is amazing, it's fantastic. But I think in a way it was given what they had gone through, you know, in this year and given the last time I had, you know, spoken to them as a group, I think, you know, the 180 degree turnaround from such bad news to such great news was probably just took a little bit of um, information just seeping into them. So, Jess, two things here. One, why were you so low key? And two, how did you get through? How have you got through 2020? <clears throat> what did you do? How did you make ends meet? Well, I've struggled, to be honest. There's no lie. I've struggled. I spent, when we first went into lockdown, I think it was March time or end of end of March, something like that. Myself and a few friends um, and my other half actually took on a job delivering for Hermes because obviously all work got cancelled. So we ended up driving to Scotland two or three nights a week delivering for Hermes basically so that I guess paid a few bills and as much as we all hated it we did it and um, but that came to an end I'm not gonna lie I spent a month or two really struggling with with lockdown and you know where's what, what if that's it and what if what I had so many questions and what ifs in my head that I've found it really tough but luckily, all negative things, they all seem to go in the end. And I started to get my motivation back. And um, luckily, I had some great people around me. You know, I could always pick up the phone, um, speak to people. And they helped me find, find my motivation back. And, yeah, since then, I've just been, I guess, training a lot. And to hear the good news of W Series, that's really perked me up a bit. Um, and looking forward and some, something to, to go on for. I know this is before a wheels turned in anger in 2021, but having missed racing clearly so much, however fast you were driving your delivery vehicles for uh, for Hermes, I won't ask whether you obeyed the speed limits and whether you're racing or not. But in terms of where, where your ambitions lie, Jess, once you get racing again, come June, and hopefully everything will will somehow be seeing um, something like racing normally, well, where do you see W Series fitting into your career trajectory, as you might say? where where What's the end goal? Do you know what? It was really, obviously, it was a massive blow for everybody. Um, and we all understood why W Series had to, you know, kind of draw the line under 2020. Um, but for me, it was most frustrating, I think, because I'd made such huge progression over 2019. I, I don't have the facility to, to do much or any testing in between seasons. And I thought that, right, if I go straight into... 2020 I'm going to start where, where I left basically and because we've had such a long break I feel like that that may have hindered me slightly but I guess everybody's got their own story but if I can start where I finished off last season I think I should be very happy with with myself um, I know that a few others are out testing quite a lot you know you get that in any championship so that's not really any different but I see next year for me, again, I'll probably improve a lot over the season. And the following season, I'm hoping, is when I can really start to go for the win. What about the vision then, Catherine, for W Series? Has that changed or is that still very much as it was or is it evolving? Well, I think that in future years, we will look back on 2020 and think that um, it was not a bad thing 
that we didn't race for the management. And obviously it was for the drivers. I'm not saying that. But as far as running the business and understanding what our vision for the business is, because and uh, I spoke with Alejandro Agag about this. The problem is when you have a new series, you're going at a million miles an hour. And that's a large strategy piece. And that's what you're describing is what is the vision can actually just be lost because what you're trying to do is, you know, you're working 16 hours a day to, to make things happen. So when you have some time off, you can start thinking about vision and strategy. And what we really do want to do is grow W series at all levels. Um, and, so, and so that means I think we need to start supporting younger drivers into the equivalence of Formula 4s and going through into Formula 3s. In future years, we may change our cars and have more powerful cars um, and then have junior um, national championships in our existing Tata's Formula 3 cars. And in that way, we can really, truly bring on all of the female drivers. So I think our, we, we are much more ambitious with our plans for W Series. I don't think it's just going to be about the existing W Series. What that will be will be the, the peak of what W Series stands for in the world. But we will be engaging girls in through karting and hopefully we can take them through um, into Formula 4 and then women from all over the world can participate in their national Formula 3 championships and then those drivers and the best of those drivers can go through into, into the top competition. Catherine, from the point of view of your role as chief executive of W Series, what does success look like for W Series as a business over the next three to five years? Where would you like to see the business and what does success look like? Well, from, from a business point of view, it's, it, it's ultimately, it's just got to be you know, making money and becoming a sustainable business in its own right and and building up the business so it becomes a you know ever increasing larger brand but i do think alongside that we do need to see our drivers going on and doing other things you know they all admit themselves but but for w series they wouldn't have had that profile um it's not to be chosen you know by these other teams for for, for them to go racing so we want all of our drivers to perform successfully in other series, but what we do need is some other drivers to to go on and be successful. You know, not all of our drivers, you know, want to be, you know, uh, Formula One drivers. Obviously, as Jess has said, she wants to be BTCC. You know, we want Jess to go on and, and perform really well. And, and frankly, you know, I will be there at those meetings, you know, cheering her along because actually I really like BTCC meetings. I'd also say that, yes, obviously BTCC is where I want to be, but W Series has got such a name for itself now, such a great name. It, it's going to, and it has done, open so many doors that I can't singly say that the only thing I want to do is BTCC, BTCC, oh my God, so many Cs, um, because a door may open that I, I hadn't, you know, initially thought that that's what I wanted to do. And there's no way I'm going to ever rule out anything. So W Series is just a pathway to, you know, a career in motorsport for me, um, a career in racing. And I think not only is it a career for women racing drivers, you know, we're starting to see more mechanics, more engineers, more female truck drivers and just women in in motorsport not just driving it is certainly growing which is great as well w series is certainly the driving force for that as well you make a really uh, good point jess because of course over the last few weeks we have seen for example the world endurance championship make some really major announcements you've got manufacturers returning uh, to world championship sports car racing porsche have announced that they're coming back in uh, Peugeot have announced that they're coming back in. Audi have announced yeah. that they're coming back in because the new hypercar regulations for the Le Mans 24 hours and for IMSA racing are proving to be incredibly popular. So I can imagine for someone like you, Jess, the prospect, for example, of racing sports cars and doing endurance racing must have huge appeal if a door was to open towards that. Absolutely, 100%. And I would not have the stature to do that probably if it wasn't for W Series. W Series is getting certainly my name better known 
you know, they, they don't know my name, but let's say they do. They probably wouldn't have heard my name if it wasn't for W Series. So it's just that W Series is such a stepping stone for, for careers, for me driving. And, you know, it may not come off, but it's certainly I've got such a way bigger chance to be within W Series than what I would have been out of it. Um, and I genuinely would not have the opportunity to race a Formula 3 on the DTM package last year or the Formula 1 package this year if it was not for W Series. So I owe them a lot and genuinely it's a dream come true and I still can't believe it's happening. Well, really interesting to hear Catherine uh, Bontmuir talking about her plans for W Series and you have to give them great credit for having secured this deal uh, with Formula One, a really big step for this championship and actually a really big step for the sport of Formula One to have W Series alongside them at those events next year. And really then, I think, fascinating, Jonathan, to talk to a driver like Jess Hawkins and to really hear about the way in which W Series is turning out to be transformational for her career. Frankly, if it didn't exist, she wouldn't be racing. And I suspect that applies to most of the, the women who'll be on the grid uh, next season. So a great opportunity for all of those women to really show their capability in front of the Formula One media, the Formula One teams, sponsors, who knows, the Driver Academy scouts who are out there as well. And Catherine uh, Bontmuir, really to be congratulated for the work that she has done, despite all the trials and tribulations of not being able to race in 2020. Do you think the series has benefited in a way from what has happened in 2020 in a way which has taken it in a different direction and also given it renewed impetus? The Black Lives Matter movement, the We Race as One hashtag, that whole environment has changed the way a lot of people consider sport and particularly, say, women in sport. I think you're spot on, Jonathan. I think 2020 has given W Series a breathing space. They've been able to reappraise where they are and where they're going. And Catherine, of course, working with her chairman, David Coulthard, has been able to really open up a conversation with Formula One and take it to the next level. Now, David Coulthard has a very good relationship with Liberty Media. The incoming chief executive of Formula One, Stefano Domenicali, has actually been working with David in other programs at Lamborghini over the last year or so. And as a result, you've got a great relationship there. And I'm sure all of that has really helped to ensure that W Series got it not didn't just get its foot in the door of Formula One, but kicked the door right open and you see the result uh, of those negotiations. So a fantastic opportunity for the series. And let's hope that they go from strength to strength. Yeah, some great venues, certainly. Now, um, how many drivers do you think, Mark? Uh, you're not meant to know the answer to this, although if you do, I'm very impressed. How many drivers get their first chance of Formula One with Ferrari? Very, very few. As you and, you and I both know, Jonathan, Ferrari's traditional approach, until quite recently, has always been to take very experienced uh, drivers into their fold. And of course, there was great surprise when they signed Charles Leclerc, for example, after only one year uh, driving for the Sauber team. But we know that the, the rules are really being rewritten in Maranello at the moment. Absolutely. Well, I mean, he's not going to be front line, but the fact is Callum Eilert has earned himself uh, a drive at Ferrari after his performances in Formula 2 in 2020 uh, because he is now going to be the test driver for Ferrari in 2021. He finished runner-up to Mick Schumacher in the F2 Championship. He impressed with five poles, the most of anyone, also three wins in the season. He's done two tests with Alfa Romeo, the most recently in Abu Dhabi after the final Grand Prix of this season. But at one stage, he was fearing, and he said as much on social media, that he'd be going to be on the sidelines for next year after rivals like Schumacher and Nicholas Mazepin were um, promoted to the Haas team ahead of him. But Scuderia Ferrari have given him the perfect Christmas present as their new test driver. And I spoke to Callum after the news had been confirmed. Obviously, uh, a great privilege. I mean, it's it's finally out there in, in the to public knowledge. Um, so from that side, you know, it's 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 an amazing privilege again to be associated with Scuderia Ferrari, first of all. It should lead to some exciting opportunities, hopefully, next year, um, which I'm very much looking forward to. How much is this a dream come true? Your first Formula One role is with Ferrari. Yeah, I mean, a long time ago, obviously, this is this is where you almost want to get to. Obviously, it's not the seat, but it's it's a prior role that hopefully, you know, will will teach me everything that is needed to be a Formula One driver. So from that side, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly excited to firstly announce it and to then move into the role and learn what I can. But yeah, when, when I was a kid, obviously my first 
Grand Prix that I went to was Abu Dhabi in 2009. And on a Friday morning, uh, we were quite lucky because a friend of ours worked in Ferrari at the time and I managed to, to get a view in the garage at the time. And yeah, from there, it's just been, you know, one of those childhood dreams that kind of is coming true. You're going to be in that garage and not just as a bystander, you're going to be there working there. You're going to be part of the team. Yeah, no, I mean, it's obviously becoming part of the Ferrari Driver Academy, I think three years ago now. It's it's something that I wanted to work towards. Um, and to be able to now become part of the team is, is obviously a, a check off the list and uh, something that I'm really proud of. How will you be involved working with the team? How, what's your role precisely? Do you know? So it's still, still some of it's in the, in the works, but at the moment it will be some simulator work, potentially some FP1s, um, but that's still to be confirmed, and 2018 car running. Um, obviously I'll be going to most of the F1 weekends to try and integrate and learn with the team and see it from that perspective uh, and learn from hopefully Charles and uh, Carlos and, and you know go from there and see what, see what happens, see what other opportunities come about, but that's the main things really. What about the test you just had with uh, Alfa Romeo? How did that whet the appetite for next season? Uh, I mean, that was that was great to get back in the car. I mean, it's a great track to, to test at. You know, lot, lots of different corners, uh, which is always lovely. And, you know, the speed of these cars is always a bit of a shock straight away. So to be able to get back in it and feel what that, that's like. Also, I had a great teammate to learn from during the test, which was Robert Kubica, which you know, it was a great comparison, really. So I learned a lot from him already in one day. And from that side, you know, it's, you just want more. You want to get back out there. You want to learn more. And yeah, I mean, these cars are amazing. The teams are amazing. Uh, it's just a, it's just a completely different world. And it's something that I'd love to be a part of more in the future. In terms of uh, 2020, then, what sort of satisfaction do you take uh, from Formula 2 and what you came second in the championship could have been the champion but you've had to accept second place but have you actually enjoyed it the satisfaction levels yeah I mean first of all we were very lucky to even get a season you know with the with the current situation and that so to be able to go into that and have you know a condensed season um, was was a benefit and from my side there's been lots of positives you know the poles the speed some wins um, it's been a been a good year for that so so I think the goal in the beginning was to always finish top three. And, you know, we were very close to, to even winning the championship. So from that side, you know, I'm, I'm very satisfied from what happened and how it went. And there's so many positives to take from that year. I would like to ask about your, you and Mick uh, Schumacher, because you've known each other for some time now. You've been at the Ferrari Academy. You've been teammates. You've been rivals. How would you describe your relationship? Uh, obviously, it's on a, a, a competitive level. I first briefly met him when we were karting it was in in the later years of 2013 or 2014 i think and then from there uh we were teammates again in 2017 in prema which was when you know i got to got to know him quite well on his younger side and then again obviously as rivals the last two years in formula two so from that side i know him personally not just at the track to a certain level and you know he's a really nice guy and he, he, he did an amazing job this year I think we've both had a, a similar last two years in, in the progression and we have a lot of respect for each other in that sense and I think you know some of the comments I made uh, in the interview with Formula 2 which I think you probably read about you know he, him saying if I had have won you know he would have been happy for me in the same way that if he if well him winning I, I was happy for him because I've, I've seen him progress i've seen what he's done he's seen what i've done and you know we have a, a nice relationship and i think respect each other in that sense and i respect quality and vice versa you did the uh, ferrari academy together what was that like working and, and living in maranello because that is a massive opportunity yeah, so I first went there the end of 2017 when, when I had done the agreement with, with the FDA. You know, it's a, firstly an amazing environment, something that uh, not many people get to experience anyway. Um, and being able to, to see everything and be around it um, is, a, is a feeling that sometimes I have to take a step back from and, and really look at where, where I am and what, what yeah, the, the environment that I'm in. So to be able to go and do that and then be in a racing driver's environment surrounded by people in the same pathway as me and you, you get to learn different ways of working you get to, to see 
how it is to be a racing driver from other people's point of views because normally you're very just limited to to what you've done and what you've seen so to be able to be around that and share that between many many drivers was was good for me and i enjoyed it a lot there you know it's, it's been a bit different this year because obviously with with covid it's not been easy to travel as much and we had to do a lot of things remotely but for the year and a half two years that i was there and based there it was it was very beneficial to me but in terms of being part of the academy what did you actually do because some people might say we just got to drive all the time i'm sure there's a lot more to it than that yeah the main the main thing is obviously driving you know that's 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 the best thing you can do um but as a as a driver obviously um i'm sure many people have reiterated this it's it's a load it's about a load of things being put together so from our side mental training physical training um different opportunities potentially with simulator and stuff depending on what you do so for me i would be going to delara to um work with my former two team to 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 help put that together um that's been actually in the last two years obviously with different different teams in formula two but to help with that and you know it's just it's just all about learning italian lessons and then you'd have individual individual times with with engineers from the formula one team in different departments to to learn about how it works on this side of the paddock you say you're not from a motorsport background but that hasn't stopped lots of people including you pushing all the way up who was your inspiration and who was someone you looked up to as you were growing up and Formula One and off motor racing became your passion. So I started at Rye House, which on the year that I started, I believe Lewis took his first first year within Formula One. So he was the one I was watching at the time because, you know, on the Sunday after the race, everyone would be in the upstairs part of Rye House watching, you know, Lewis go ahead and try and take the win. So from that side, he was he was the one at that time. And then obviously, as I learned a bit more about motorsports, I learned you know a bit more about the history. And Ayrton and Michael were probably the ones that you, you heard the most about and the most inspirational. So from from that side, I think it's a very standard answer. But there's reasons why everyone says that. Calamite has definitely got his feet on the ground, but he also had to have a pretty natty change of wardrobe because we did that interview in two parts. We did one part in Alfa Romeo colours on the Monday before the test, and then there was a slight tip-off, or should we say inkling, that maybe there was going to be an announcement later in the week and it would be a pity not to have at least some reaction to whatever was going to emerge. Was it going to be with Alfa Romeo, or could it be, as it turned out, with Ferrari? So then we did part two of the interview after the announcement was made, and he looked very striking in his Scuderia Ferrari scarlet top. And you will know all about this, having managed all sorts of things in your time in commercial director and as a team owner as well. You've got to make sure you play the media, but at the same time, get the message out when you want it. You're in control. It's just hilarious, isn't it, Jonathan, to see how quickly things change in this sport and quick, how quickly a driver has to change his uniform. Sergio Perez will be getting rid of all that pink, uh, all these pink shirts that he has from his racing point days, getting ready to swap into his uh, Red Bull gear. And Callum Islet, as you say, going from Alfa Romeo to Ferrari. Really interesting to hear him. He's a very level-headed guy, clearly very competitive. I get the impression he's, on the one hand, delighted to be announced at Ferrari, but probably quite fundamentally disappointed that he's not racing in Formula One because he's clearly just so anxious to get behind the wheel again. But if he's patient and also recognises that the road to the top is never a straight one, it's very seldom a straight road to the very top of our sport, I'm sure his time will come. But he's been part of the Ferrari Academy for some time now, so therefore he's part of the family. They've looked after him, and let's see where this relationship will develop because there have been there are many twists and turns. You ask any Red Bull driver, never mind any, anyone who's worked in any Formula One team, you think you're going up, then you're going down. It's snakes and ladders often. He, at the moment, seems on a ladder. Yeah, and, you know, one of the things that we never really talk about, Jonathan, is the fact that when a driver goes from Formula Two to Formula One, the, the, whole, the scale of everything changes. And to be part of the biggest, most famous team in Formula One, to be part of Ferrari, he is going to have some extraordinary experiences. He's going to be there at the car launch next year, standing you know, alongside Carla Sainz and Charles Leclerc. He's going to be doing all kinds of programs with them on the marketing side. He's going to be embedded in the technical side. It's going to be a life changing experience for Callum Eilert, irrespective of the fact that he's been part of the academy until now. 
he's moving into the big time with the Formula One program. So a wonderful opportunity, and we be we will be following him very very closely. And let's hope we see him behind the wheel of a Formula One race car in a race before too long. Going to be fascinating to see. Final show, though, of 2020. We're talking already about 2021. This is it for 2020. Thank you for listening to At The Controls, for liking, sharing and reviewing. Thank you to all the teams and contributors for taking part, Surely We owe them a, a massive vote of thanks, Mark. Yes, absolutely. You know, when we started out on this uh, path at the beginning of the year, pre-COVID, it has to be said, this wasn't a COVID-inspired podcast, but uh, we just, we fortuitously decided uh, to do this. Thank you so much to you, Jonathan, for uh, your hard work this year and to the the unseen and unheard producers to Chesie and Claire who've put up with uh, all of my inadequacies as a presenter and made us all sound uh, tremendously good as the season has gone on. It's been great to have all of them. And thanks to all of you, to all of the listeners for your support and your feedback and the messages that I've received during the year, because all of that is really taken on board and helps us to frame the kind of content that will take us forward. And here's to motor racing as we'd like it in 2021. Mark, Chesie, Claire, thank you very much, Need. Thank you again for all your comments and constructive criticisms. They're always welcome. Here's to Melbourne in March 2021. Hashtag stay well. (laughs) 